On this week's A Road to Peace, we explore North Korea KCTV footage on inter-Korean basketball matches and the ongoing civil war in Syria. We also discuss possible growth models for North Korea post-denuclearization. Lastly, we take a look at the musical South of the Border and how inter-Korean cultural exchanges are bringing the two Koreas together. Hello and welcome to our program. During a trip to Hanoi on July 8th, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo appealed for Pyongyang to replicate Vietnam's miracle of economic growth by improving ties with Washington. Vietnam and China are formerly communist countries that have underwent market-oriented economic reforms. On this week's A Road to Peace, we'll discuss possible growth models that North Korea can follow post denuclearization But first off, we will shed light on North Korean culture and society reflected in the country's broadcast from a couple of days ago. Let's take a look at a short clip from its KCTV. Vietnam Tongil Longu Gyeonggi가 4일에 이어 5일에도 류경 정주영 체육관에서 진행됐습니다. 첫날 경기에서 민족 화해와 탄압에 좋은 분위기를 마련하며 깊은 인상을 남긴 북남 롱구 선수들의 경기를 보기 위해서 각계층 평양 시민들, 체육인들과 해외 동포들이 모여왔습니다. 북과남의 남녀 롱구 종합팀들은 각각 홍팀과 청팀으로 나뉘어 친선 경기를 했습니다. 재치있는 특기 동작들로 연속 점수를 올리는 양팀 선수들에게 관람자들은 아낌없는 응원을 보냈습니다. 경기 휴식 시간에 민족의 슬기와 오센 기상을 과시하는 우리 태권도인들의 시범 출연이 있었습니다. 북과남의 선수들이 훌륭한 경기 장면을 펼쳐 보일 때마다 관람자들은 선수들과 함께 뛰는 심정으로 응원하며 장례를 통일 열기로 뜨겁게 달고 있습니다. 경기를 관람한 국가체육지도위원회 위원장인 조선노동당 중앙위원회 부위원장 최희동지, 조명균 통일부 장관을 단장으로 하는 남측 대표단, 선수단의 주요 성원들이 선수들을 만나 경기 성과를 축하해 주었습니다. 북과 남의 선수들은 한대 어울려 기념 사진도 찍고 서로 올스 안고 격려하면서 다양한 기술과 경험을 나는 데 대해 기쁨을 금치 못했습니다. 관람자들은 통일 롱구 경기를 통하여 북남 사이의 교류와 협력에 기여한 선수들을 향해 손을 흔들고 환호와 박수갈채를 터치 올리며 따뜻한 인사를 보냈습니다. 북남 동일 농구 경기는 역사적인 판문점 선언을 실천으로 받들어 나갈 북남 체육인들의 의지를 시비하고 북과 남이 하나로 뭉치면 민족의 존엄과 기계를 더 높이 떨칠 수 있음을 보여준 계기로 되었습니다. 얼마 전 수리아 정부군이 성명을 발표해서 디르 알 주르도의 전체 사막 지역에서 이슬람교 국가 테러 분자들을 몰아냈다고 선포했습니다. 이 사막 지역이 수리아 중부 험수도의 행정 경계로부터 이라크 국경까지의 지역을 포괄한다고 성명은 전했습니다. 얼마 전 중국에서 새 기술 시험 위성을 쏘아올 예정된 궤도에 진입시켰습니다. 위성은 서창 위성 발사 센터에서 장정 이호병 운반 로켓에 탑재돼서 발사됐으며 위성들 사이의 연결망을 구축하고 세형의 지상 관측 기술 시험을 진행하는 데 미용된다고 합니다. 장마철 피해를 미리 막기 위한 대책적 문제들에 대해서 알려드리겠습니다. 아시아, 아프리카, 아메리카 등 세계적으로 이 많은 지역들에서 이 태풍과 폭우, 만원비, 이 해일로 인해서 커다란 인적 및 물적 피해를 입고 있습니다. 지난 시기 우리나라에서도 이러한 자연 현상으로 해서 이 적지 않은 피해를 입었습니다. 지금 현재 장막에 들어선 것만큼 각 부모들에서는 이러한 자연재를 미리 막기 위한 데 각별한 주의를 돌려야 할 것입니다. 지금 현재 우리나라 이 주변 지역들에서 이 태풍 활동들이 좀 심해지고 있습니다. 앞으로 이 태풍 활동으로 해서 이 장마 전선이 우리나라에 올라오고. 이 장마 전선에 또 영향을 해서 각 지역들에서 폭우와 만원비, 이 신바람, 이러한 재성 현상들이 나타날 수 있습니다. For today's discussion, we're joined by John Delury, professor at Yonsei University, Graduate School of International Studies. Welcome back to our program, professor. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Uh, so we just watched footage of the inter-Korean basketball friendlies that took place in Pyongyang. Apparently, they were an important, significant event for North Korea as well. Yeah, I mean, I think this is uh, part of the 
the new game we're seeing, which is positive messaging uh, domestically about South Korea, about the state of inter-Korean relations. So this is one way in which sports diplomacy and other kind of cultural diplomacy can just, can just keep some wind in the sails of the effort at rapprochement and inter-Korean reconciliation. So I think, you know, those kinds of reports are important. Uh, they're not decisive, but they're important. Well, we saw a lot of cheering fans from the footage, but North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, who is known to be a big uh, basketball fan, wasn't there in the stadium. Do you know why he wasn't there for the event? There's been a lot of discussion about that on the American side as well, because, of course, Secretary of State Pompeo was in town, and he didn't get to see Kim right. Jong-un. You know, so this is one of the discussions right now, is where was Kim Jong-un? It was interesting to see, actually, Nodong Shimun, the North Korean paper, uh, then came out and told us there were about seven pages of photographs of Kim Jong-un uh, during these events. He was visiting farms, factories, uh, really sending that message that we talked about before, and I think we're going to talk about today about the economy, mm -hmm. you know, and he's out there uh, in, in different parts of his country, really, I think, trying to rally people to say we got to develop the economy. Mm -hmm. So uh, that does feel like a slight, especially in terms of Secretary Pompeo, uh, for inter-Korean relations, you kind of wonder why isn't he there. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to just look at the message he's sending, which is focus on the economy. Now, KCTV also aired some international news coverage. During your time in um, Pyongyang, did you see, were you able to access some international broadcasts from North Korea's television programs? One of the trips that I made um, was right after the New Year speech that Kim Jong-un gives right. at the beginning, that must have been 2013. And, you know, you, I did see that phenomenon of just endless clips. Any TV you turn on, there was Kim Jong-un giving that speech over and over again. So that's more sort of what we expect, the redundancy. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an interesting clip because you see little snippets of international news. Um, I think that, you know, there's some messages about the Chinese satellite for mm -hmm. sure because, of course, one of the controversies is North Korea's, uh, well, their missile program is highly controversial, but in a way more problematic is their satellite program, mm -hmm. right? And this is one of the things that we could see North Korea saying, yeah, we're, we're doing all this stuff on nuclear and missile, but satellites are different. So it's interesting that they have that message showing, look, the Chinese get to do it, you know, uh, followed by weather, and of course satellites are used for weather monitoring. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you can read into that a little bit more about the message North Korea is sending domestically. But are those international news coverages limited to only China, or are there more countries that North Korea can um, broadcast about? Because I would think that the countries would be limited to those that have diplomatic ties with Pyongyang. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, I don't watch enough of the coverage to really uh, say. I think in the clip that we saw, uh, Syria, a hot spot, a world spot, a hot spot in the world was noted, and it seemed to be sort of taking the line of the Syrian uh, government uh, that North Korea does have good relations with Assad. Um, it was a message against terrorism, against ISIS, which is sort of interesting. But yeah, uh, you know, you wouldn't expect North Korean uh, world news coverage to depart from their diplomatic priorities. They will reflect the preferences of the state. You know, that's how the media works in North Korea. <laughs> Now let's move on to the latest developments on the Korean Peninsula. After his third visit to Pyongyang, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo kind of mentioned that North Korea should follow the Vietnam model, miracle model for economic growth. What did you make of that statement? Well, that was interesting. You know, I mean, Secretary Pompeo was in Vietnam, so it's natural that he's thinking about it. Uh, but, you know, two things sort of stand out in terms of why would Secretary Pompeo mention Vietnam. I think the big one is really Vietnam is a model for Americans in terms of really fundamentally changing a relationship. You know, Vietnam is a country, obviously, the United States fought a brutal war. It's mm -hmm. seen as a bad war. Uh, many Americans died. Um, and, of course, very negative feelings on the Vietnamese as well. And in the 1990s, uh, the two countries were able to, to bury the hatchet and develop a positive relationship with one another. So I think that was probably the main thing in Secretary Pompeo's mind, mm -hmm. is Vietnam as a model of reconciliation that the United States can reconcile with his enemies. Uh, I think the second part is more about Vietnam's own path through economic reform and development. So I think there are maybe two levels to his thinking. Uh, then can you elaborate more on what the Vietnam model is and how it would be a suitable model for North Korea to follow? 
Well, so Vietnam, um, you know, these, these reform processes are highly complex. Uh, and we tend to simplify them into kind of one moment. And so that moment for Vietnam came in the mid-1980s, in 1986, when the party leadership announced a new policy, uh, Noi Moi. That policy was, uh, had been preceded by a lot of experimentation, but then that was a decisive turning point where the Vietnamese Communist Party uh, made the decision to really move forward with a transition into a market economy or a partially marketized mm -hmm. economic system. So that's referred to by different names by scholars. You know, a socialist market economy uh, is one of the typical names for it. And it allowed the Vietnamese Communist Party to stay in control, to keep their political system pretty much intact, uh, but to achieve huge growth uh, that's been sustained over decades now. And that turning point came in the, in the mid-1980s. Um, so there are certainly uh, lessons that Kim Jong-un and North Korea could learn from Vietnam. Um, you know, there's some similarities in terms of uh, where they're positioned, you know, on either end of China, this big developing economy. Um, it's a little bit closer in scale to North Korea. Uh, and of course, the main one, though, is what we would say the political economy mm -hmm. of Vietnam, where you keep your political system intact. You keep a communist party, one state, one party state, mm -hmm. but you really fundamentally change the economy and you integrate it into the rest of the region and into the world. And that's something that we're all sort of looking for Kim Jong-un and North Korea to do. Before the mentioning of the Vietnam model, there were also speculations that North Korea was eyeing on a Singapore model. Mm -hmm. During Kim Jong-un's visit to Singapore for his summit talks with U.S. President Donald Trump, he said he was interested in learning about the Singapore experience of economic growth. What kind of appeal did you find from that kind of model? Well, so Singapore, if we look at it quickly, historically, Singapore precedes Vietnam. Vietnam was a little late in this process mm -hmm. of, of economies making this kind of transition. Uh, Singapore is what we would describe as an authoritarian capitalist mm -hmm. system. And so its big reforms go back to the 1960s under Lee Kuan Yew. Uh, and what Singapore did is they kept basically a one-party state as well. Very tight control in the political system, but very open, very entrepreneurial, and capitalistic in terms of their economy. And that was a great formula for Vietnam's economic success. It's one of the wealthiest countries per capita uh, in the world. Um, so, you know, it's interesting. I was down in Singapore uh, on the sidelines of the, the great summit. And, you know, you can go down. It's actually right across the, the river from one of the places that I gather Kim Jong-un went as he kind of walked around the town. And you see there are little statues. There are busts of some of these kind of great modern Asian leaders. And so the Singaporeans have put up a statue to Deng Xiaoping mm -hmm. because Singapore worked very closely, kind of inspiring China's reform. Uh, there's also a statue of Ho Chi Minh, the mm -hmm. Vietnamese leader, and they talk about Ho Chi Minh's connections with Singapore and also Singapore's ties. Once Vietnam made that change, uh, they worked together with Singapore and ASEAN countries to, to develop. And I have to say, I was walking along the river thinking, Man, is there going to be a, a bust of Kim Jong Un one day? You know, because could, in, could be. in a certain way, some of the things he wants to do really fits this model right. that the Singaporeans have, have been very supportive of uh, of Asian leaders, whether they're capitalist or authoritarian or democratic, liberal Democrats. Singapore's attitude is it's really kind of non-judgmental. It's, you know, we'll work with you mm -hmm. to improve the quality of life of your people. And so Singapore uh, helped China a great deal mm -hmm. uh, in, in their path. And I think I sensed, and in my conversations in Singapore, I sensed Singaporeans are really ready to as soon as North Korea, Korea makes that turn. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the environment opens up, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they're the first ones in to really get, you know, North Korea going as, as kind of the last Asian tiger. Um, mm -hmm. That would be a very natural consequence of Singapore's path. So all this would have to begin with North Korea kind of opening up its economy. What kind of benefits can it enjoy other than Singapore's kind of economic aid? What other benefits would it be able to have through an open economy? Yeah, well, so again, if you look at, if you study these models that we're talking about, um, actually South Korea is another one, um, a key element was this moment 
where the leadership of these countries had to open up, had to bring in foreign capital, mm -hmm. foreign right. investment. They also had to go out. They had to plug in their economy uh, to the region and also into these globalization trends. And so, you know, in Asia, uh, that's been a story of extraordinary economic success and benefit, you know. Um, and also, it's, it's worked well for the political systems, you know, for the leaders. And so I think that's one of the messages that certainly the Trump administration keeps trying to send to Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong you can be one of these heroes. You know, you can be someone who dramatically improves the standards of living of North Koreans, and you solidify a legitimacy, a kind of heroic status that's on par with kind of some of these great Asian leaders of the, of the 20th century. So I think uh, there are many risks, to be sure, but it's, it's high risk but very high reward mm -hmm. in terms of the way that North Korea could be transformed. Now, we can't leave out the China model. Uh, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has made already three visits to China to improve ties with the country, but why hasn't North Korea tried to follow in the footsteps of its chief ally? Well, you know, my background is studying China, and as I started to, to learn more about North Korea, this was one of the first questions I had. And no one's going to like this answer, but I'll, I'll never forget meeting with a very good uh, China expert. She's a, a Korea expert in China. And I put this question. I said, well, why don't they just do what you guys did? Mm -hmm. And her answer was, they are. And this was probably 10 years ago. The answer was, they are doing what we did. They, they are. are following the China path. Because what was the China path? China under Mao Zedong in the 1960s got a nuclear weapon and a nuclear deterrent. Uh, on the basis of that, in the early 1970s, China normalized relations with the United States, the famous visit by Richard Nixon. Uh, then Mao died, Deng Xiaoping took power, and it was in the late 1970s that China finally started this huge change in terms of its economy. You know? And so the point of this expert was, be careful what you wish for. You know, they are following our path. Um, and look, many experts think that may be what we're seeing. You know? Actually, I would say among experts, probably the consensus view is North Korea is never going to give up its nukes. You know, that, that's not a controversial view. Now, I'm of the view that we have this much of a chance you know, to convince them they can't really follow directly in China's footsteps. You know, they're going to have to trade away the nuclear deterrent in return for the economic benefit that they, that they stand to gain. Uh, but you know, I don't think the North Koreans have made that decision. So I don't think we can, we can say now whether they will or they won't. You know, this is the diplomacy that we're seeing. Can you convince them to follow that path? And I think it's going to be difficult. So you had a very, a very little chance of optimism, and you're kind of guarded when it tor comes towards North Korea's I get this question plans. so often, you know, and everyone's talking about optimism or pessimism. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that uh, we be neither. Because optimism says, this, is, this will work. Well, we don't know this is going to work. Exactly. But the pessimists are just as wrong. The pessimists say, no way they'll give it up. And they don't know that. Mm -hmm. I don't think Kim Jong-un knows. I don't think the North Koreans know. You know this is what we're trying to do here uh, in terms of a kind of strategic shift where North Korea changes its, its relations with the United States with South Korea, where it becomes a kind of normal East Asian economy right, that's developing, and along the way they give up that nuclear capability. Um, that hasn't been tried before, mm -hmm. you know, and we don't know uh, what, what the answer is going to come out to. So I think it's wrong to be a pessimist. I think it's wrong to be an optimist. We just have to analyze every step of the way. I think we also need to discuss the economic sanctions imposed against North Korea. When U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo um, visited North Korea, he said that until final and fully verified the nuclearization of the North, there won't be any lifting or scaling down of sanctions. But then again, uh, during the meeting between the top diplomats of South Korea, U.S. and Japan, they kind of said that um, it could happen simultaneously, the denuclearization process and the economic benefits. Which is the correct answer? I mean, how do we analyze this different kind of stance? Well, I think the politically correct answer is we only lift the sanctions after complete denuclearization. Mm -hmm. I think the geopolitically obvious answer is you're only going to get North Korea to, to really give these capabilities up in a parallel process mm -hmm. where they're giving pieces up and we're putting pieces in, right, which is making them feel more secure, and they're also seeing prosperity. 
So I don't see a way forward where North Korea is in a serious way giving up its nuclear deterrent capability. And we are not along the way uh, lifting sanctions, um, bringing them in to the regional economy, uh, bringing teams from the international financial institutions, from China's uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, you know, to, to start to change the way the North Korean economy fits into the region and into the world, you've got to change that along the way. Otherwise, I frankly would be very skeptical of a denuclearization process. You know, I would say, well, they couldn't really be giving it up. You know, these things have to happen in tandem. It's much harder to do that. Uh, politically, it's less appealing to say it, but I think that's the reality we face and we should just work our best at that. Okay, thank you, Professor Delury, so much for your insights. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. The Seoul Performing Arts Company was founded in 1986 with an aim to extend inter-Korean cultural exchanges. Amid improving relations between the two Koreas, the company presents a contemporary musical with a story that the two Koreas can relate to. Let's take a look. The reconciliatory mood on the Korean peninsula is driving a new wave of change in the South Korean cultural scene. Efforts are underway to use culture as a catalyst for bringing the two Koreas together. Among them is a contemporary musical presented by the Seoul Performing Arts Company, a theater group founded some 32 years ago to boost inter-Korean cultural exchanges. The musical, South of the Border, tells a story of North Korean defectors in the South. First staged in 2016, it recently made a comeback. Two years ago, tensions on the Korean Peninsula were at an all-time high, following the North's repeated nuclear tests and the closure of the Kaesong Industrial Complex. Despite the unfavorable situation, the theater company, with a discerning eye for cross-border cultural exchanges, decided to produce a musical about North Korea. South of the Border takes on a completely different meaning now, with recent thaw in inter-Korean relations. Based on the movie of the same name released in 2006, the musical follows a young couple who are musicians in the Manse Art Troupe in the North. Horn player Sonho and actress Yeon Hwa are deeply in love and plan on getting married. But in an unexpected turn of events, Sonho escapes from the communist country to South Korea. As he settles down to a new life across the border, Yeon Hwa arrives in the South to reunite with her love. The heartbreaking tale of the couple is a poignant reminder of how a divided Korea is affecting the everyday lives of its people. <laughs> But the performance also carries a message of hope amid fast-changing developments on the Korean Peninsula. 결국 예술이 할수 있는 것들은 어떤 공감이라고 생각합니다. 결국에는 그쪽 땅이나 우리 땅이나 다 사람들이 살아가고 있고 사랑하는 사람들이 함께 살아가고 있는데 우리가 사랑하지만 그럼에도 불구하고 함께 할수 없는 현실들 어 그래서 우리가 좀더 사랑하는 사람과 곁에서 함께 희망적인 내일을 꿈꾸자는 그런 메시지를 전달하고 싶었습니다. The musical's interpretation of inter-Korean division and defection in the form of a melodrama is garnering a favorable response from the audience.
In addition to bringing the musical South of the Border back to life, the Seoul Performing Arts Company organized four seminars during the month of July to foster a dialogue about where inter-Korean cultural exchanges stand now and where they should be headed. Arts and culture have the power to connect people. Hopefully, there will be a wider range of cultural exchange programs between the two Koreas that can bring South and North Koreans together in the days ahead. This is all we have for you today. We will be back next week. Thank you for watching.